everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's delightful to be attending this uh, event, which looks really, really exciting. Now, the role of the chair is to talk as little as possible and give as much time as possible for the speakers. So um, in order to have the best um, time for speaking and thinking together, um, I propose that we uh, group the presentations together first. So we're going to have David de Milan, uh, who's an Angelos, um, um, sorry, Angelos, I've forgotten your surname, who's go, who, go, who, um, uh, who are going to talk about uh, secret spaces. Then we're going to have Zoltan Dragon, who's going to talk about photography uh, of emptiness. And then Sebastian Birima, who's going to talk about blueprinting the utopian city and populist politics. So um, we, I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves in the way that they want to introduce themselves and um, uh, just get on with giving the presentation and then we'll take all the questions and discussion at the same time. To start the discussion, if you have thoughts, please put your remarks for the speakers and who you are addressing them to, if there's anyone in particular, either in the chat or in the Q&A. I prefer it if you could do it in the chat because it's easier to moderate just one place, okay? But I will try and look at the Q&A in case somebody's used it. Okay, so let's... Um, start then with David and Angelos and they're going to tell us a little bit about their paper. Perfect. Hey, how are things everyone? Uh, my name is David O'Malan. I'm a first year a PhD student in DCU um, where I'm studying sexuality studies. Um, my research focuses on public sex cultures and their link to contemporary art and also to queer politics as well. So my presentation is, is uh, with my colleague, Angelos Bolas, who will introduce himself there now as well. Hello everyone. Um, so yes, my name is Angelos Bolas. I also uh, do my PhD in DCU, in Sexuality Studies. Um, I focus on um, media representations of HIV suffering in post-Trump culture. Perfect. Okay, so I'll kick off our presentation. So um, it's a presentation that relates to the 2020 exhibition by the French artist Marc Martin. It's an exhibition that really pays homage to the shadowy den of queer desire, uh, the public bathroom. Within queer culture, these spaces have frequently been appropriated as cruising grounds. So cruising is the subcultural practice of searching for sexual partners in public space. Lots of different spaces can of course be cruising grounds, but the public toilet really stands out in the cultural imaginary, probably due to bathroom scandals like the US presidential aide Walter Jenkins in the 1960s, and more recently the pop singer George Michael in the 1990s. As a space, the public toilet is undoubtedly a liminal zone that blurs the boundary between the public and private. And these spatialized concepts are also intimately connected to a history of queer politics. Legislation decriminalizing homosexuality undoubtedly was a boon for gay rights, but the legal protections they offered were often only extended to queer people engaging in sex in the privacy of the home. So a zone of protection was afforded to homosexuality that was really contingent on its relegation to the private realm. So public expressions of homosexuality really remained open to disciplinary action. And we saw this in the UK, for example, in the 10 years following the decrim of homosexuality, the recorded arrests for cruising doubled, the number of prosecutions trebled and the number of convictions quadrupled. So this kind of push to privatize homosexuality, alighting its presence from the public sphere also really undergirded the no promo policies in America and section 28 in the UK. So for those that don't know, both of these are kind of governmental policies that prohibited the promotion of homosexuality in the public sphere. As Anna Maria Smith states, this privatization of homosexuality effectively divided queer people into good and bad homosexuals. Whereas the good homosexual hid their alterity, the bad homosexual refused to be contained, sullying the pristine heterosexuality of the public sphere. 
within that kind of spatial paradigm, the cruiser, of course, was firmly marked as bad. The politics of gay liberation in the 1970s, though, was really focused on making the private public, embracing queer visibility and sexuality as well. But while the 1970s saw sexual revolution and a shift in attitudes towards public sex, the catastrophe of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s wrought a really profound change on the sexual landscape. And a kind of attitude of blame emerged that really condemned the sexual freedoms of the past as being a causative agent in the emergence of the disease. Instead of advocating for safe sex practices, we saw gay writers like Larry Kramer and Andrew Sullivan become key figures in developing a large response to the crisis that was grounded in monogamy and the vilification of promiscuous sex. Therefore, public sex quickly became synonymous with both risk and disease. Queer people eager to garner the safety of mainstream acceptance vocally rejected the sexual figure of the cruiser and embraced a politics of representation called homonormativity. So Lisa Duggan describes homonormativity as a rejection of the publicizing strategies of the gay movement, gay movement of the 1970s and an embrace of domesticated, depoliticized privacy. It's an outlook that really untethers queer people from the political and also the sexual past. In their analysis of cultural memory and AIDS, Reed and Castiglia state that reconfiguring the sexual past purely as a site of infectious irresponsibility operates as a form of collective forgetting, willed amnesia that promises queer people a safer future. Shared collective cultural memory is important for communities though. Ignoring the complicated history of queer sex creates a rift in memory, harming queer people both young and old. Marc Martin's piece, Relique, a flawlessly clean enamel toilet sign pictured above, is presented as a critique of polished representations of the past that smooth out memories into simplified narratives of oppression, risk, or shame. He expresses a desire to intervene in cultural memory and reaffirm the social and sexual connections at the heart of these spaces. The exhibition can be toured virtually online which is very helpful during COVID times. And you can get a sense of its layout here just from the image on the left. On the far right, as you enter the exhibition, Marta offers a really detailed historical analysis of the public toilet in Europe from the 19th century onwards. The central ground floor area consists of appropriated artifacts repurposed by the artist. In the center, we have an antique pissoir. And on the walls, we have these kind of uh, graffitied doors from toilets with decades of sexual inscriptions palimpsested across the wood. Whereas the lower level is grounded in the tangible and the real, moving upstairs brings us to the works showing the artist's creative fantasies of utopic cruising spaces. Our presentation aims to explore the cruising space excavated and created by Martin, arguing that by layering historical fact and appropriate artifacts with his own creative fantasies, Martin presents the cruising space in heterotopic and utopic terms, thereby contesting a homonormative perspective of shame, while also reaffirming the public toilet's connection to queer history, intimacy, and fun. It proposes that this intervention in the collective cultural memory is a reparative act of spatial justice. So Foucault outlined his spatial concept of the heterotopia in opposition to utopias. Whereas utopias are virtual spaces that depict society in an idealized form, heterotopias are real places. And he offered six principles to describe them. The first principle categorizes them into heterotopias of crisis or deviation. Martin documents the installation of urinals in Europe as occurring in the wake of the 19th century hygiene movements. The erection of these facilities created heterotopias of crisis, semi-private spaces where men could respond to a urgent call of nature. But these spaces also succeeded in meeting other more sexual needs as they presented a convenient pocket of intimate space for clandestine same-sex encounters. Therefore, the exhibition also presents the public urinal as a heterotopia of deviation, a space where heterosexual norms were suspended and contested, even for a short while. The second principle specifies that the function of the heterotopia can vary over time. Marta's exhibition demonstrates how the public toilet developed into a space of connection and education, 
sexual encounters and graffiti messages not only acted as a form of sex education, they brought men in contact with a queer world. In the 80s and 90s as well, the public toilet was a nexus where information on safe sex and HIV and AIDS could be circulated. The third principle relates to the heterotopia's ability to juxtapose ostensibly oppositional realms within the one space. We know that the public toilet collapses the boundary between the public and private realm to create a liminal zone. So crossing the border renders the user into a liminal persona or threshold person, as described by Richter Turner. And Turner writes that within these spaces, threshold people, and I quote, are betwixt and between the positions assigned by law, custom and convention, end quote. Martin's exhibition highlights the liminality and blurriness of these spaces in noting that sexual encounters occurred across the lines of class, race and sexual identity. The toilet's juxtaposition of seemingly oppositional worlds is also evident in the artifacts and pieces that focus on queer graffiti. Within these spaces, queerness mingled with heterosexual masculinity as straight men were able to read intimate same-sex fantasies from the toilet wall. The fourth principle relates to time and the heterotopia. Foucault divides them into spaces where time ceaselessly accumulates or where time is more fleeting and ephemeral. Martin's exhibition arguably collapses the distinction between these two chronological categories. The public toilet itself is undoubtedly an absolutely temporal space. Sexual encounters are ephemeral by nature, occurring in a contracted segment of time. However, pieces like Bearers of Hope blur the distinction between contracting and expanding time when showing layer, years of layer graffiti on toilet doors. In his book on cruising and art, Mark Turner states that graffiti on toilet walls affirm, and I quote, the overlapping non-consecutive interwoven contact that goes on all around us all the time, end quote. Therefore, each etched inscription can be understood as a human trace, a queer node in a fragile web of belonging and connection. In enmeshing the ephemeral with the everlasting, Martin solidifies, solidifies rather the value in personal intimacy can have for queer people. The fifth principle is something that's probably fairly self-evident for public sex cultures, gaining access to these kinds of sexual spaces was often contingent on being fluent in the nonverbal cues of cruising, or in the case of the image here on the right um, from the exhibition, gaining the confidence of a person known as the watch queen, somebody who was posted outside the toilet to keep, to keep watch. So Martin's exhibition really, I suppose, demonstrates the subcultural complexity of, of cruising culture as well. Two minutes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the sixth and final principle describes the heterotopia's relationship with the wider world. So Foucault described this as existing between two extreme poles, either as a space of illusion or a space of compensation. The second category is the one that's interesting because it describes how a meticulously organized space can stand in stark contrast to the messy, complicated world beyond its walls. And as you can see from the doll vote, dollhouse view here, a lot of consideration went into the spatial curation of the information and artworks. The flow of the exhibition's contents combined with its layering of fact and fantasy arguably, arguably construct the public toilet through a compensatory heterotopic lens. In doing so, the exhibition draws our attention to the public toilet's position as a site of education, excitement and queer connection, thereby counteracting narratives that have configured the space as being solely connected to homophobic oppression, empty and personal intimacy and also disease. As already stated, the key difference between heterotopias and utopias is that one is real while the other is virtual. Within the exhibition, the lower level immerses the viewer in the heterotopic space of the public toilet, while the upper level, by contrast, is focused on a new utopic world constructed by the artist. Within these stage photographs, the bathroom tiles gleam pristine, fetish gear is proudly displayed and the disciplinary gaze is distinctly absent. The artworks on this upper level undoubtedly represent an idealized conception of queer space, one that abandons the signifiers of shame and disease in favor of radical visibility and bold sensuality. To conclude, our approach hopes to demonstrate that the heterotopic and utopic spaces exposed and created by Martin enact a kind of reparative spatial justice. Instead of a simplified narrative of shame and oppression, we see how queer culture has had a complicated history with the public toilet. 
the queer space that emerges from the exhibition isn't pathologized as deviant or eulogized as inherently radical or utopian. These complex spaces potentially held danger, but they also offer queer people a pocket of space for connection, education, and ludic, exhilarating sexuality. A space where the ostensibly solid boundaries of social category and sexual identity could blur and collapse for a short time. Martin's work reinvigorates a queer sexual politics of making the private public, thereby rejecting a desexualized approach to queer history. And that is everything from me. Thank you so much, guys. It's fantastic. Perfect timekeeping as well. And so we're going to move uh, immediately from this very full and heterotopic paper to a paper about uh, emptiness and desolation uh, uh, through in photography with Zoltan Dragon's uh, presentation. So welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? It's like a yes. seance. Can you hear me? Are you there? So. <laughs> I'm Zoltan Dragon from Hungary. Uh, I teach at the University of Szeged. Uh, I'm uh, with the American Studies Department there. My areas of research are, uh, well, I come from a literary theory background that I shifted to film theory, then to digital culture and uh, theories. And now I'm interested in uh, photography. So, um, and also uh, space, um, obviously. Um, so the title of my presentation today is uh, Desolate Cities. I hope that you can see uh, something. Uh, so Desolate Cities, uh, the photography of emptiness in times of a pandemic. <clears throat> there is a striking resemblance between the photographic images spreading through uh, the media during the COVID-19 pandemic situation, depicting empty city centers, long avenues, once buzzing tourist destinations, and the imagery of desolation and uh, heterotopic isolation in um, movies. Can I just stop you for a second, Zoltan? Yeah, sure. I can't see your screen. Can others see Zoltan's screen there? Okay, it's just something to, sorry for interrupting. Carry on, if everyone else can see your screen, that's fine. Hopefully, I mean, this is a, a strange solution. Uh, so you can only see the floating images and floating words. Uh, if you can see me and you can see the images appearing next to me, then that's it. If you cannot see whatever is appearing, then there's a problem and I can solve that, hopefully. Uh, it might be my view, sorry for interrupting. Carry on, please. Okay, can others see? Uh, the image right now? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Fine, thank you, sorry. <laughs> so uh, there's this uh, similarity with the media images and these um, uh, fantasies of Hollywood and other filmmaking uh, knots in the world. Zombie apocalypses, uh, intrusion of cosmic horror disrupting uh, human civilization. Cityscapes, cities, uh, uh, spaces of commute, of business in general, uh, they become, uh, they are actually built for human traffic and transactions. They stay erect without their function, devoid of their cityness, yet re emerging from the background uh, to be the sole center of attention. And at the same time, uh, memorials of a life lived among uh, their structures. The city becomes an image, an image that was never meant to be taken. Um, as it reveals the empty void at its very center, a city can only be a city if it frames civic activities. Now, this image of the city, deprived of its very reason for being, redefines our concept of social spaces. The lived space becomes a hallucinatory interplay of pixels constantly reformulating on our digital interfaces. Our maps and street views they uh, are no longer symbolic representations of reality, but are only resource and way of contact uh, with a space once inhabited by people. What happens, to, what happens to our spatial memory if the photographic overrides the lived experience of passing through, imposing its rules of composition and point of view on our spatial coordinates? What happens to our perception if it is merely haunted by the experience of movement through landmarks, be they institutional uh, or personal, public or private, as the vision of space becomes superimposed by structures of the photographic. 
Abandoned urban spaces have always been uh, constructive parts of the geopolitical landscape of the city as humans intentionally created slices of spaces between architectural units. Literally, the spacing between infrastructural and architectural places organizes not only traffic passing through, but helps us assess surroundings at a variety of temporal and visual scales, which also means that uh, the emptiness of these sites never equals being devoid of meaning or of cultural significance. Indeed, the emptiness of a space, like that of an ancient Roman forum, postulates a social function that upholds the functioning of the social. This model postulates a Mubius strip-like logic in which uh, one side uh, of the strip continues with the other, an invisible trick that sustains the three-dimensionality and functionality of the designated urban structure. This makes sure that the space becomes inhabited precisely because it is empty to be filled in by design. So empty and full, desolate and crowded are postulated by one another. What we face today, however, uh, during the lockdown situations are urban spaces, desolate, urban spaces desolated that is emptied out to use Parvin Adams' term uh, in photographic representation. So the social function postulated by the emptiness by design becomes uncanny as it stubbornly retains that emptiness against its purposed functionality. It is a short circuit in the operation of the social media strip as it causes a shift in modality our intimate spatial memories become ultimately extimate. Extimacy is a term coined by Jacques Lacan uh, to appropriate the Freudian term unheimlich as related to the dichotomy of inside and outside subject and other real and symbolic. As Mladen Dollar explains, and I quote him here, it points neither to the interior nor to the exterior, but is located there where the most intimate interiority coincides with the exterior or end becomes threatening, provoking horror and anxiety. The extimate is simultaneously the intimate kernel and the foreign body. In a word, it is unheimlich. This illustrates the present day emptying out of the streets and city of cities and consequently the emptying out of the site of the city that is its photographic representation. Normally, we do not get to see the city without being a city. And now the monstrous architecture that arches over the citizen is uncanny because our subject position is foreclosed from it. It is substituted by a vantage point that we, never can, op uh, that we can never occupy in reality. Herein lies the ambiguity of the photographic reorganization of urban space. What is new in the contemporary situation is that it is a heavily mediatized spatial experience that behaves according to the rules of photorealistic photo representation, hence the rules accumulated by the practice of photography. Emptiness thus is defined through the image that becomes the ideal digital map that positions the virtual travel uh, right in the center Unlike the traditional cartographic practice of laying out diverse spatial configurations without an obvious point of identification. As digital mapping services position the subject in the center of the world, so does our digital interface offer the new window through which we get a glimpse of the world out there. This has serious consequences. As Philip Auslander argues based on his reading of Hans Belting, another quote for you, we are experiencing a shift in pictorial representation in the media scape in which with the lived experience and the live nature of the image loses its ontological integrity and presence becomes ultimately entangled in mediatization. This mediatization lures us with its immediacy of connection to others, their spatial embeddedness, but is by definition hypermediated. It is the mode of hypermediation in which the rules of the photographic are taking over the modes of representation. When I mention uh, immediacy and hypermediacy, I use uh, J. David Bolter and Richard Gruss in terms. Immediacy is the desire for a transparent interface between the representation and the viewer, while hypermediacy is a style of visual representation whose goal is to remind the viewer of the medium. I see these two interrelated in this situation in a way that what appears to be immediate is ultimately hypermediated, not only because we use some kind of media technology, 
but because what we see is overtly framed by the logic and ideology of the media technology. In our case, this is of course, uh, photography. Photographic composition, uh, the creation of vantage point, resol the resolution of the image, detail, the rules inherited from painting, ultimately the rules of monocular representation should be considered here in the first place. place. Photographic imagery builds up a virtual city. Think of Microsoft's uh, uh, Photosynth uh, or Google's NERF, that is neural radiance fields for unconstrained photo collections, which is basically Photosynth on steroid, uh, in which empty sites become leading lines and framing devices in a pictorial meaning. The reconfiguration of spatial coordinates according to the rules of photography redraws the cityscape fundamentally. And we have no immediate reality check because of the lockdown situation, obviously. And also because uh, the empty space is definitely not the one that we can recollect in our uh, spatial memory. We should also consider the effect um, of the photographic on our own vision. What we really see is our mind's reconstru reconstruction of objects uh, based on uh, input provided by the eyes. So it's not the actual light received by the eyes. It is a continuous montage of two vantage points, uh, overlapping, intersecting, intersecting uh, scanning, and ultimately embodied and immediate. I think there's no need to point out that the photographic uh, would not fit uh, this list at all, uh, because it's hypermediated, non-embodied, and in this respect, non-human, to use one of the definitions of non-human photography by Joanna uh, uh, Zelinska. Zielinska's insight further applies if we consider the emptiness of the images themselves. They become detached from the human element and this way also become non-human again. Photography as a technique uh, for the logistics of perception, to use Paul, Paul uh, Virilio's term, is not only framing memory right now, as the general critical claim uh, would argue with regards to the power of photography to capture the moment of time, but is colonizing the immediate experience. In other words, it realigns our spatial experience and spatial memory by its own rules. That is, what is at stake is not merely the representation itself, but our own experience and memory. Furthermore, the photographic here not only mediates, but presents itself as immediacy while playing by the rules of hypermediation, creating the extimate experience that hooked me on this uh, issue in the first place. So in conclusion, spatial coordinates of the city are reformulated via media imagery instead of our lived experience of this space. This vision is framed by the logic of the photographic, deprived of the intimacy of human vision bringing forth the extimacy of the non-human. Non-human in being a social space devoid of the social. Non-human in presenting a vision based on ma machine optics instead of real human vision. And finally, non-human in being emptied out of human bodies, the citizens in the flesh. As Miyako Ishiuchi claims, uh, photographs are a created reality. And perhaps we can add to this, that this created reality presents itself as revealing the very emptiness of the spatial organization that insists as emptiness, contrary to its function as preceding uh, being a lift uh, space. The stubborn lack of appearances of citizens conversely empties out the image itself as well, since the visually created space cannot but present itself, present itself as empty. This is the uncanny or unheimlich core uh, of the photographic representation in times of the pandemic, the foundation of the extimacy in the plethora of visualizations of the city in lockdown. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. We're all uh, clapping silently. I suppose we have the reaction uh, uh, thing there. And uh, perfect timing, despite my stupid interruption. So we have plenty of time now to um, appreciate what you've just said and uh, reflect on the first presentation and also now to invite Sebastian to uh, present his presentation. Cool, yeah, I'm just going to keep 
myself or my camera off because my internet is really dodgy and especially if I'm sharing the screen as well. Um, try not to overdo it. Can you guys all see this? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, hi, my name is Seb. I'm um, a PhD student at NUA Galway looking at politics and sociology. And in particular, I've been looking at populism. Um, so this, uh, this paper is very much a work in progress. So just kind of bear with me as it's still a bit rough around the edges. And also um, as a confession, it doesn't entirely or it doesn't at all um, follow the, the abstract that it says in the, um, uh, the uh, proceedings for this. Um, so we're just gonna run with it. Um, but my research looks at populism from the perspective of urban space and the built environment. And utopia seems to be an unavoidable mediating concept that pops up wherever I most and least expect it. Um, the built environment obviously has many well-known links to utopian city planners like Le Corbusier and and Ebenezer Howard, uh, but there is much less research on the relationship between populism and utopianism. So I'll be drawing some connections between those two phenomena here. In particular, there's some really interesting thematic and theoretical parallels between uh, debates about utopianism in the first half of the 20th century and debates about populism today. Uh, so seeing as I don't have that much time, I'll talk briefly about anti-utopianism and anti-populism, as I assume most of you will be pretty familiar with those traditions, um, and then spend a little bit more time talking about Gustav Landauer's work on utopia and how that relates to Ernesto Leclerc's populism. Um, also be uh, referring to Le Corbusier as an example uh, to kind of like ground this theoretical discussion a bit more. Um, generally don't use them a lot of my research, but I'm just gonna go with it here because uh, the man is just a caricature of a utopian city planner. So I know it, it presents it quite well. Um, right, so just, oh, uh, how do I do the thing? There we are. So to start off with anti-utopianism and anti-populism. Uh, so the dominant common sense approach to utopianism, at least in political theory, uh, is described really well by Ruth Levitas who describes it with these two equations. So utopia equals totalitarianism equals communism equals Marxism equals socialism and communism equals totalitarianism equals fascism. Um, so yeah, this association of utopian ideas with violence and dictatorship tends to dominate a lot of thinking on utopia, both in academic and lay circles. Um, this image by the way is from Le Corbusier's Plans for Paris. Um, and this approach to utopianism has been critiqued plenty of times, so I won't repeat that exercise here. But what is interesting is that the main themes of this view of utopianism are very similar to the way that populism uh, tends to be critiqued. Uh, so the points that they both uh, they tend to come back to are that uh, they are totalizing and anti-pluralist, teleological, and overly simplistic. Um, so firstly, this view holds that both utopians and populists treat society as a unified totality. Uh, they represent an attempt to face all divisions and create a unified body of the people. Uh, and essentially that this image of the people is one assumes that there is a single correct solution to society's problems and that any opposition to this vision uh, cannot be tolerated. I'm not gonna read out the whole quote here, but those sentiments are pretty clear in Le Corbusier's work. Uh, again, turning to his plan for Paris, um, as you can see in this image, he, um, does not really pay any attention to what was previously there and straight up argued that the, the plan is, or at the very least ought to be the dictator. Um, and secondly, these utopian blueprints tend to be treated as teleological in the sense of being uh, at the end of history. So this act of determining everyone's rightful place in society and in the city is considered as a, a one-off event. There is no need to revisit any political questions afterwards. Um, and this critique, which is in some cases quite legitimate, uh, again, turning to what Le Corbusier had to say, uh, also, again, returns in a lot of research on populism. And then finally, it's argued that both populism and utopianism rely on uh, naively simplistic interpretations of the world. They simply don't understand how, real how complex reality is, um, the, the narrative goes. Uh, and as a result, not only are all these solutions bound to fail, uh, this will actually reinforce the first two points as when reality doesn't conform to the plan, we must force it into the submission using violence. 
And obviously I'm generalizing a lot here, uh, but essentially what we end up with is a, like the, the mainstream approaches to both utopianism and populism uh, tend to equate them with totalitarianism or at the very least with uh, like authoritarian impulses. Um, what I find a much more interesting way of thinking about utopia is a tradition that started with Gustav Landauer um, in his like book Revolution in 1907, uh, but it's kind of continued by um, like Mannheim and Bloch and even Ricoeur. Um, and this perspective highlights utopia's emancipatory rather than its authoritarian potential. So rather than associating utopia with a platonic ideal society, Landauer looks back on the revolutionary history of Europe taking the, the peasant wars and the Anabaptists in the 16th century as a starting point. And the, the narrative he builds up is quasi-anarchist. So Le Corbusier's blueprints aren't really a suitable case study here, but I'm gonna try and stretch the example a bit anyway. This is, that does highlight um, another more sympathetic side. Um, so Landauer argues that society tends to swing between states of relative stability, which he refers to as topias, uh, these states of stability are only relative because they're always con contained within, yet at the same time outside of themselves in excess, uh, which he calls utopia. This utopian excess challenges the, the established order of any given topia. So for Landauer, the logic of utopia is very much a dialectical relationship, whereby the topian and the utopian represent competing social formations. Um, at the, the point of revolutionary rupture, the utopian imaginaries held by the oppressed at an individual level are then collectivized in order to build a new society. Um, and if it's successful in this constructive task, uh, this utopian outburst will then settle into a, a new utopian formation. Um, so from this perspective, uh, too heavy a focus on the lack of complexity or the, the totalizing. Uh, so for Landauer, Utopias respond to the society that they grow out of um, and create a space for thinking through alternatives. While Le Corbusier's Ville Radieuse, um, like his plans for Paris, um, may itself have been a, a closed totality, um, it must instead be read uh, in relationship to the atrocious living conditions in European cities in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, if anything, these utopias highlight what is wrong with the existing society. Um, and this also shows that Landauer is approaching utopia from a, a very different level of analysis than those who argue that utopia is inherently to totalitarian, like Popper or Gray. I realize I should probably name some names. Um, but yeah, in Heideggerian terms, Landauer looks at utopia from an ontological perspective, whereas the anti-utopians focus on its ontic content. Uh, and in denouncing specific utopian ideas as totalitarian, they necessarily end up embracing a rival conception of the good society uh, and down downplay the injustice that gave rise to the utopian adverse in the first place. Um, right, from here, I wanna jump to Ernesto Leclau's work on populism. Leclau is a bit hesitant about the, the term utopia. On the one hand, he recognizes the importance of imagining a better future. But on the other hand, he also argues that the pursuit of utopia is both impossible and dangerous. Uh, so to some extent, he's bought into the narrative that utopia is a pipe dream. Um, but in saying that, the logic in which populism oper operates for him is very similar to utopia for Landauer, uh, even though he comes from a very different tradition of thought. And as far as I know anyway, he doesn't engage with Landauer, Mannheim or Bloch. Uh, but yeah, rather than starting with the Anabaptists, Leclau uh, begins with a hypo hypothetical industrial city. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't read out the whole quote, but feel free to have a, a read through it. Uh, but what it comes down to is that if people have a grievance, they'll go to the authorities to get it, get it addressed. Then if the government can't or won't deal with this issue, and other people also have unmet demands, you're quite likely to end up with a, a relationship of equivalence being established between these different, different grievances, creating a, a frontier between the people and the unresponsive institutional system. And at that point, you've kind of got... I'm seeing some uh, faces of people not hearing me. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, but yeah, so at, at that point, you've kind of got like uh, populism uh, in its uh, like, yeah, most basic form. And from this perspective, populism is not a, a movement as such as a, a certain logic of doing politics, which uh, develops from a, a response to a wrong or to an injustice. 
So it opposes the institutional logic of the existing hegemonic order with its own populist logic, whereby it claims that the excluded are actually the real people. And this claim from a, a part of society, society to stand in for the whole is generally what the anti-populist tend to let on to. Uh, but just like when it came to the utopia, focusing on the, the injustice in this um, hypothetical exclusion ignores the actual exclusion of the, the current order. So Leclerc writes that if a society managed to achieve an institutional order of such a nature that all demands were satisfied within its own imminent mechanisms, there would just be no populism. Uh, what we end up with then is a, a dialectic between a Gemini for Leclerc or Utopia for Landauer, um, which as a result of its own contradictions is challenged by populist or utopian movements. And if these uh, movements fail, uh, the excluded and marginalized peoples they had brought together are once again scattered and isolated. Whereas if they succeed, they end up institutionalizing their own um, imaginary to form a new hegemony or utopia. And in this way, history kind of becomes a, a repeating series of resistance and institutionalization. Um, but yeah, to, to start concluding um, slowly, uh, there are obviously some differences between the Klaus populism and Landau's utopianism. Uh, Landau's work operates as a, a theory of history writ large, whereas the Klaus populism has a much more narrow scope in that it specifically describes the construction and reconstruction of the identity of the people within the, the context of particularly modern liberal democracies. Uh, nonetheless, a lot of contemporary discourse on populism kind of mirrors these debates on utopianism in the, the first half of the, the last century. So on the whole, the anti-utopian and anti-populist arguments focus on the, the ontic content of these movements, while theorists approaching these phenomena from an ontological level tend to be much more sympathetic. Uh, and this doesn't mean that they're completely blind to the potential dangers of these movements. Um, as Landau and Leclerc both note that just because these movements are challenging and unjust order doesn't necessarily mean they'll replace it with something better. Um, and we kind of see that with a lot of right-wing populism today, for example. Um, but their treatment of the status quo as merely one possible conception of the good society among many, uh, among many allows them to recognize the emancipatory potential of both populism and utopianism. And these parallels tell us a lot about the, the nature of populism, which is currently a big debate in democratic theory. And I kind of yeah, want to wade into this by suggesting that contemporary populist movements represent a utopian constellation. And treating populism as a form of utopianism allows us to, to draw on the things that we've learned from the, the study of utopia in order to get some insights into these contemporary debates that have been overlooked thus far. And most importantly, at least for my own research, um, is the, the that this means more of a focus on urban space. As the discussion on Le Corbusier highlights, utopia is a very complex and sometimes kind of contradictory relationship with the built environment, uh, while most of the work being done on populism at the moment draws heavily on linguistics instead. So even though populism hasn't involved city planning on the scale of Le Corbusier, by thinking about populism as a utopian impulse, we've got a, a clear framework for introducing space and place into that analysis of populism. Um, and I think that's everything. Thank you.